Evening. My special guest tonight is the epitome of stardom. His spectacular rise from obscurity to the pinnacle of his career as a songwriter, singer, and complete showman is the stuff of which dreams are made. Like his idols from the golden days of Hollywood, he's talented, outrageous, and controversial. And he's left behind him a trail of hits, which in any history of popular music would guarantee him a chapter all to himself. In the next hour, we'll be sharing his reaction to this brilliant career and some of the songs which have made him a legend. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Elton John.
Welcome. You're just back from a tour of the, of the States and I believe an interview with the President of the United States, sir. Y yes, I did have an audience with the uh, President. Um, he requested that I came. Um, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I did actually go... <laughs> I went to see him uh, and to give him a bit of advice, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, he gave me a belt buckle and he was very nice. And uh, I actually saw him on a day that... Uh, the whole Middle East uh, situation broke loose, uh, and it was, uh, he'd been up since six o'clock in the morning. It was a bit parallel to Maggie Thatcher, really, in, in, during the Argentinian crisis, sort of having tea with Cliff, and you know, saying, I'm sorry about this, I've just got to have tea with Cliff Richard for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so it was kind of a... Was he a fan? I don't really know if he's new, new I don't know. It was, it was organized by somebody in the White House. I don't know if it was uh, propaganda about um, first rock star seen in White House with President Reagan. Um, I somehow, when I met him, I don't think he actually knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it, all joking aside, it is a very great honour, you know, to, to be invited to the White House. Yes. Um, you must occasionally sort of pinch yourself when you think, I mean, you move among, in, in Britain, you're a friend of the, of the royals and you meet President Reagan, you've travelled all over the world. Do you ever sort of pinch yourself and wonder what happened to Reg Dwight? Yes, it's... Uh, I know what happened to him, um, <laughs> but it is, uh, I've done a lot of things that I never ever in my life thought I would be able to do. Mm. I mean, or, you know, if I'd have taken bets as a kid that I would be dancing with the Queen at, uh, in, in, at Windsor Castle, I mean, the odds would have been staggering. Dancing with her? Yes, well, I did, you know. I played at uh, Prince Andrew's birthday party last year, um, 21st birthday party, which is probably one of the most frightening things I've ever done, because you sit there, you go out on stage, and it's a beautiful room in Windsor Castle, and the whole of the royal family were there. And you, you see the, you go on stage and you see these empty gold chairs and you think, oh, Christ. <laughs> um, uh, and afterwards, you know, we, um, we were invited to stay and have supper and, uh, you know, we danced and everything like that. I, I was able to meet Lady Diana. It was very nice, you know, I don't really like to talk about it too much because I don't, you know, I don't think they would like it very much. But I did actually dance with the Queen, you know. Mm. I what? danced with a man who danced with Do you do a bit of that, there? Uh, yes, I did, jiggery pokery and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I mean, we did dance to Rock Around the Clock. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, I mean, I didn't think that was bad. Being coming from a council house in England and suddenly ending up by dancing with the Queen to rock around the clock. <laughs> it's not bad, it's... No. Uh... What, how, how old were you, in fact, when you started playing piano? Um, I think I started... Uh, my, my grandmother, I used to live in my grandmother's house because my father was in the Air Force and my mother and I used to stay with my grandmother. Um, so I probably about three or four. Um, and I used to sit... There was always a piano in the house and my auntie played piano. And I think uh, my granny used to sit me on her knee and, uh, and I used to just pick it up. I just pl uh, started playing. And what were the sort of musical influences in those days on you? Um, on me? Well, I was always lucky because my mum and dad had um, a, a radiogram in the house. So I grew up, and I always hate to say this because it makes me sound so old, but it was like uh, Guy Mitchell, Frankie Lane, K-Star. In fact, my, my dad was a big fan of George Shearing, um, jazz pianist. So I grew up with them. Um, I was always lucky enough to have records around the house. My parents both collected records. And I, I grew up in that uh, golden age of dance band music, Billy May and stuff. What about the other kind of music? I mean, when did you, you discover that there was another kind of music which excited you? In the bath. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one, my mother used to come uh, home every Friday night. She used to buy a record every week. And I remember her coming home one Friday and saying, I've just bought these two records. I've heard this new sort of music. And it was Heartbreak Hotel, Elvis Presley, and ABC Boogie by Bill Haley. And she put them on the radiogram. And um, I'd never heard anything like it as well. That was the first time I'd ever heard rock and roll. And I was immediately hooked. Was it at that moment that you decided you wanted to be a rock and roller? Not really. I just wanted to play. Um, I started to listen to Little Richard records and all the pian piano players who played rock and roll. All I wanted, I knew in my life, I, I had a goal in my life. I didn't know, I didn't want to be become what I am. I mean, that all happened by accident. I just wanted to play piano or sell records in a record shop or be surrounded by music. And I found that was a great advantage when I was young to actually know what I wanted to do. Did your parents um, go along with this uh, ambition of yours? Um, well, my dad, my parents divorced. Um, my dad was always a bit anti what I, d uh, I do. And, uh, Why? Uh, basically, because he was a snob, really. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. He'd, um, I can't understand it. He came from a working glass background and played trumpet in a dance band. Um, Bob Miller and the Miller Men, in fact. Oh, yes, good band. Yes. Um, but, um, you know, when I was... My parents divorced when I was about 13, and my mother marries my stepfather. 
And my father didn't really give me that much encouragement. Um, in fact, he was, he'd rather I worked in a bank or something like that. And my mother and my stepfather always gave me all the encouragement I needed. He's presumably changed his mind now. Not really. He's still a miserable sod. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I take it there's no great love lost then between Not you really, and your no. I mean, no. I, I mean, I don't like to talk about him that much because no. I'm, you know, he's, he has his own life to lead. What really did irk me is that the fact that he. I was one of the brother and sister when I grew up, ah, uh, and I was an only child, and he, you know, he didn't particularly like children very much, and when he got married, he had four kids in four years, four boys, and now, of course, I've made it. They've all got to be better than me, so they're sort of like, sat down, you will play the piano better than me. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I've tried to patch things up with him, and it didn't quite work out, so that's, you know, I let bygones be bygones. But leaving that, that uh, the, what you think about uh, him apart, um, did it have an effect on you, your parents divorcing? I mean, did, you, what, did it isolate you? Did you feel very lonely? No, I wanted it to happen the quicker the better because, um, you know, the things were so, you know, it was so chaotic and so awful for my mother. And beside the fact that my mother was um, having an affair with the man that's now my stepfather, who treated me great, he let me have a drop handlebar bicycle, for example. <laughs> there was no chance that I was ever gonna have a drop handlebar bicycle with my father, forget it. <laughs> I, was still wearing, I still was wearing sandals and white socks. Um, so, no, I just wanted them to get over, uh, to, for it to happen as quickly as possible so that uh, um, my, my, you know, my mother could uh, marry my stepfather and I could have someone who actually t took an interest in me. When did you start moving toward the, 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 the rock and roll star image? I mean, when did that, that sort of happen for you? Well, I don't think I have a rock and roll star image. That's the most confusing thing about me. I mean, do you mean when I went solo and stuff like no, that? No, no, what, what I meant was, when did you, first of all, let's take your trademarks, for instance. I mean, let's say the glasses. I mean, yeah. did, have you always worn glasses? Yes, I wore glasses to start with because I, I couldn't quite, I, I had a very minor, um, I don't know what, I just couldn't see the blackboard very well, but it wasn't a major thing. And I, because of people like Bloody Shadows and Buddy Holly, who were very popular at that time, I wore black rimmed glasses and I thought it was fashionable and I wore them all the time. Henceforth, my, well, my eyesight got worse and now uh, I have to wear them all the time, or contact lenses. And what about the clothes? When did you start dressing differently from, from other people? <laughs> <laughs> now, when did people start looking at you, giving you uh, curious looks in the street and things? Um, oh, when I used to stale and dress up in my mother's clothes. Uh, <laughs> That's the confession I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> not, um, well, not, see, as a teenage, a teenager, even my mother was pretty strict about what I wore. Um, uh, and I wasn't alla allowed to wear hush puppies and things like that, which is like, ridiculous. I mean, hush puppies. But mods wore hush puppies in England. So it was strictly taboo. So when I actually became successful as Elton John, it was like sort of carrying my teenage years onto my, into my 20s. I wore everything I did, everything that everyone said I couldn't do before. So um, I was always too portly to wear jeans, um, and I probably still am. Um, but I, I was never allowed to do, never allowed to really to wear what I wanted. Um, and I was very, very uh, inferior. I had a big inferiority complex as a child. What very about? Introvert. Um, what about? About the fact that I had three legs. <laughs> can, we, can we have a close up of Mr. John's third leg? <laughs> can we have a magnifying glass? <laughs> God, it's hot here. It is hot. <laughs> but what was the inferiority complex about? I mean, just about you being, being, being I, fat, I, were you, or what? No, no, it's probably because I was scared of my father, and I just, you know, I just... I, just, I was very introvert as a kid. Mm. Um, I never realised... Uh, I look back on my career and try and analyse sections of my career, and I used to play in a band when we were backing Lung John Baldry, who was a singer in England, and at that time he was playing cabaret, and I left the band, I never had, and I look back and think, how come you had the courage to leave the band? Because I would never say boo to a goose. It's just that I would not play to people that were eating while I played. I just, and that, for me, that's a, the death of a musician. It's just awful. Right. And I just, I don't re recall how I actually had the courage to do that. Um, and I, you know, I gradually got out of it, but I had it. So an inferiority complex, maybe that's unfair, but I was, you know, I was, I never really, I was afraid, I never had, really had my own identity, I don't know. What was your mum's attitude toward the, the, the more outrageous of your, of your clothes? I mean, um, well, there were certain times when Bernie and I first, Bernie Torp and I first got together as songwriters, um, when the Beatles, when the Carnaby Street happened, and there was all the Beatles, the old uh, soldiers' uniforms and the old overcoats, and we would get something from a jumble sale for like for 10 bob or something. And she would not walk on the same side of the street as me. <laughs> no way. Totally she would do something. I mean, I would run and she'd run as well. <laughs> um, now, she was. 
she accepts it now, but in those days, I mean, she was she always wanted me to be very smart and everything like that. She, well, in those, I grew up in an era when th probably values were different. Yes. Um, um, stricter, probably. Yes. Well, immaculately turned out tonight, sir. I mean, uh, beautifully attired. Let's have a reminder here of, of you at your most outrageous in terms of attire. It's a clip we've got from Tommy, where you are the pinball wizard. Coming up. <laughs> Just before the break there, we saw you um, in Tommy. Um, playing the part of the pinball wizard. Is it true that uh, Rod Stewart was offered that part? Um, this is a great story, actually. Yes, it was. <clears throat> they, uh, they took about two years to cast the movie of Tommy. And in fact, I was originally offered the part that Oliver Reed had in the movie, and I think Mick Jagger was offered the lead of Tommy or something like that. And for two years, no one would touch it with a barge pole. Um, and then Pete Townsend phoned me up. Oh, no, I, Rod Stewart said, they've offered me this uh, part of doing the pinball wizard. I said, don't stay. I said it's a disaster area, this movie. They've offered me this part. Said, they don't know what in the bloody hell they're doing. Forget it. <laughs> and then uh, about a year later, Pete Townsend rang me up at home. He said, listen, will you do me a favor? Will you sing pinball wizard in the film? So I did. <laughs> I was, it was one of the most successful sequences in the film. They paid me a lot of money, and Rob was subsequently furious. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I, mean, I can't really blame him. You're, you're often quoted as being sort of arch rivals and enemies. Would that be true? We're not, uh, we may be rivals to, such a, to, to an extent, but we're certainly not enemies. I'm probably closer to him than probably maybe anybody in the business. Um, we just have this thing in, when, we, when, when someone brings a subject up, or either me or him, um, that we just have a go at each other. Yeah. It's a little bit like Bob Hope and um, Jack Benny. And what do you call him? What's your nickname for him? A Phyllis. Phyllis. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it was always Long John Baldry and the Hoochie Coochie Men uh, featuring Phyllis Stewart. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was written up at the toilet of the uh, Eel Pie Island, where we used to do many a gig in London. Yeah. And uh, it was embarrassing because my nickname is Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it has made the daily press in England that there's Phyllis and Sharon. And it's, it, it's okay, you know, but when you go to the, you're walking past uh, the porters at London Airport and you're wheeling your trolley and someone says, Hello, Sharon! <laughs> <laughs> you sort of freeze and you don't look back. Um, but no, he's always been known as Phyllis. Yes. He looks like a Phyllis. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, the thing with him and I is we're so... If he, we had two houses, we had a semi-detached house next door to each other. My house would be immaculate, the gardens would be fabulous. I mean, I'd have a little sort of like a, maybe a BMW, well, that's probably too, too expensive. Well, probably <laughs> a, a nice car in the driveway and there'd be a nice greenhouse at the back. He would have overgrown grass. <laughs> he would be hanging out with a, rollers and a fag and he'd be hanging out the wash. <laughs> And I would be shopping at Sainsbury's and he'd be at Tesco. <laughs> <laughs> he's a slob, in other words. Um, well, not a slob, but that's his common as muck. It's common yeah. as muck. <laughs> that's his autobiography, common as muck. <laughs> let's, let's talk about somebody else, a giant of, of, of music, who, in fact, you were very, very close to. That was John Lennon. Yeah. If I don't think I'm right in saying he was killed while you were in Australia the last time, wasn't he? Um, in 1980, 1980. We, were, I was, uh, we were flying from Brisbane to Melbourne. Um, John Reed, my manager, was already in Melbourne. And the whole band was on the plane uh, and the road crew and everything. And when we got to Melbourne, um, they said, the whole of the Elton John party, we must all stay on the plane. And I knew something instinctively was wrong. And I, uh, whenever I go away, I always think of my grandmother, who's quite elderly, who lives at my house. And I always think, oh, God, I hope nothing's happened to her. And when my manager came on the plane, he was crying. So I thought, oh, Christ, you know, something has happened. And he knew instinctively someone was dead. But then he told me that John was dead. Um, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was in shock. I, I, didn't, I didn't show any emotion whatsoever. Um, everybody else had a great effect on them immediately. It didn't have an effect on me immediately at all. Um, that night, I thought, well, we, got, we went out and, to an Indian restaurant. My mother and father were on tour with me as well, and they met John. And we all got absolutely blind drunk and had a great time and sang songs and everything like that. Um, it was only till I was doing Imagine on the, t on the whole tour that, uh, that year, and it was only till I played Imagine three days later in Melbourne that it hit home. But it still doesn't hit home to me because I still don't think he's dead. I always think of him as still being alive. How close were you to him? During the latter part of his, uh, the last two or three years of his life, I didn't see him hardly. We used to phone up, I used to phone him up maybe once in a blue moon, or I used to, uh, he used to send me a Christmas card. But friendship doesn't, ex uh, you don't have to phone each other up sometimes when you're friends. And he was just uh, bringing up Sean, who is my godson. But when I first met him, I've never honestly met anybody who's influenced me so much, who I respected so much, and I cared for so much. I mean, you met John Lennon, you fell in love with the guy. He's incredible. I mean, just he taught me so much. He was amazing. Did you see Yoko and Sean when you were over in New York this last time, playing the, the concert there? They came, I, we, I played Empty Garden, which is a tribute um, 
chapter two, John, uh, written by Bernie Taupin. Uh, and I, th I thought on the tour, when we get to New York, that's gonna be the town where if I'm gonna get emotional about anything, that's gonna happen. So I didn't get emotional, I was very relieved. And uh, I got up after the number and I was tallying myself down. This is the first night at Madison Square Garden. And then all of a sudden I saw there was Yoko and Sean on stage and the whole place just erupted for five, six minutes. And that was a very emotional moment because I hadn't seen Sean really since he was a little baby. Um, and then Yoko, I was speaking to Yoko, he said, you must come and spend time with Sean because he grew up with John as a father and John spent a lot of time with him all the time. And he needs that relationship with somebody being near him. So I went over and um, bought him a boat and, and spent some time with him. Um, and it was great, it was very gratifying. And you know, when you become a godfather, it's, e it's easy to say, I've, in fact, I've got five godchildren. And it's easy to say, yes, I'll become Godfather. But in that certain circumstance, yeah. one has the responsibility. And yeah. I, you know, she wants me to carry that out probably, Mom, because she's handled the situation extremely well. And he's an incredible kid. He's a sweet kid. Well, you're going to do, in fact, aren't you, Empty Garden for us now? Yes. As you said, written by yourself and Bernie Taupin. Yeah. And uh, so the piano is over there. Elton, would you go over and play Certainly, for us? sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Elton yes. John, um, the song written by <laughs> Bernie Taupin and himself. Was the, uh, you were talked to a, a, bit, a lot about John Lennon, who was obviously one of your heroes. What about the other heroes that, uh, that, that you have? Um, people like, I know you're inordinately fond of Groucho Marx. Did yes. you ever get to meet him? Yes, I was lucky enough to, um, uh, in the early 70s, Groucho did a series of concerts, um, which my agent uh, promoted in America. And I went on holiday with Brian Forbes and Nanette Newman once uh, to Malibu. We all went, about 10 of us went to, to, um, to Malibu for a holiday. And Brian knew someone who uh, knew Groucho and, and my agent, and they, and they managed to, uh, to arrange a meeting where Groucho would come over to the house. So we were very nervous. I mean, when you meet a legend like that, you get, we found out what he liked to eat, and the, the, the fact that he liked a log fire, even though it was 95 degrees outside. <laughs> and he arrived at the door with a berry and an overcoat on, and we were all like, kind of like this. my God, Groucho and Marshall's going to happen. And he sat down, he'd only been there a minute. He said, When do we eat? And I said, Oh, Christ, when do we eat? I mean, he was just playing games with us. In fact, uh, I became very friendly with him and very, uh, my manager took him to see he's Jesus Christ Superstar. And on the way, he picked up two young blondes, um, <laughs> a delicatessen. He was, um, he, he could never understand why I was called Elton John, never. Um, uh, and he, he, he gave me a, a poster of the Marx Brothers to John Elton from Marx Groucher. <laughs> 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 what about you? Met you met another of my heroes too, Catherine Hepburn. Yes, I never met her. Yes. In what circumstances did you meet her? Well, again, she was a very a big friend of Brian Forbes, um, and I used to live practically next door to Brian in Wentworth in England. And Kate likes to swim, and uh, we have a swimming. We had a swimming pool, uh, and uh, Forbes he didn't. So she, when we met her, and she's sort of, she's the sort of person that comes in and re reorganises your living room. Oh shoot, that shouldn't be here. It just takes control. Yeah. And so I said, listen, any time you want to come around and use the pool. So, in fact, one, uh, one Sunday, uh, we were having lunch at the house with Stanley Baxter, the comedian, whose idol is Catherine Hepburn. Um, and we're sitting outside having lunch, and there, at the end of the lawn, this bicycle appears <laughs> with this incredible-looking woman on it, but, and Stanley Baxter's eating, and he suddenly sees that it's Catherine. We've only just been talking about it. Catherine Hepburn cycles up the lawn, and... I mean, poor Stanley Baxter went into shreds. I mean, it just crumbled. <laughs> so we all went swimming, and she's like doing like 4.5 turns off the diving board, and I'm just about inching into the water. Um, and she, there was a frog, dead frog. I'm frightened of frogs. Don't ask me why. Uh, but I am frightened of frogs. And there was a dead frog in the, in the, at the bottom of the pool. And I wouldn't go in the pool. <laughs> How butch. <laughs> no way was I going in that pool. Uh, and she said, nonsense, this is nonsense. So she got a huge leaf. She dashed to the deep end as well. She dived down, picked it up, wrapped it in and just threw it out. And I said, how could you do that? She went, character, dear boy, character. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, uh, to, uh, to, I've met quite a few. I mean, when I went about Groucho, Marx, Marvin Hamlish was Groucho's pianist. That's really? what he was. Marvin right? Hamlish. Yeah. And uh, look what happened to him. Yeah, I wish I'd have been bloody Groucho Marx's pianist. <laughs> <laughs> 
What about, um, one of the things I didn't realise uh, about your career was that at one stage, and I understood all about the pub pianist, and we, in fact, toward the end of the show, we're going to get back on the old pub piano again and we're all going to have a sing-song, are we not? Well, we, we they are. know the words, yeah. But um, one of the jobs that, that I didn't realise you had was that you used to do cover versions of, of hits for a for a, a sort of a cheap record company. Yeah, well, I mean, they still do them. Um, there was a Robin Gibb number one record called Saved by the Bell, and I did a, a cover version for a Dutch company, which I got paid 25 quid for, and I had to do Saved by the Bell, and the only way I could do it was going, Saved by the Bell, on your own. <laughs> By, by the end of the sixth take, I look like Arthur Mullard. My neck is out of this. <laughs> All right, fine. Save your voice. We'll be back in a moment. All right. There can be no doubt that the songs of Elton John will be sung and played for many years to come. Just as the songs of Gershwin and Porter have become standards, so songs like Candle in the Wind, Danielle and Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and this next song will be Tomorrow's Evergreens. Ladies and gentlemen, Elton John and his latest hit, Blue Eyes. Like a deep blue sea on a blue, blue day. Blue eyes, baby's got blue eyes when the morning. Um, 
Your career seems to me to, to add a sort of logical progression with only one hiccup, and that was in 76, was it not, when you sort of decided that uh, you weren't going to tour anymore, and mm. you went for 20 months, I think, without uh, working in the, in, the, in the business. Why was that? What, what led to that? Well, it all stemmed from the fact that John Lennon used to say to me in 1975, when I was the height of my success in America and throughout the world, for God's sake, stop, you know, enjoy some, some other part of your life. He said, you've, you know, you, your whole life just evolves around being Elton John, which it did. And a year later, I saw the light, um, and th I came off the road, uh, and um, luckily it coincided with the fact that being involved with a, a soccer club, I was already involved as a director. Um, I didn't go behind my big gates at Windsor and sort of sulk. Um, because it is a conscientious uh, decision, you have to accept that other people are going to take over from you. Um, and, you know, your ego is such that you have to be prepared for that too. But I, I definitely wanted to do something other than be Elton John. And so I became lucky enough, as fate would have it, the former chairman of the soccer club said, I'm giving you the chairmanship. And so I had something else to do. Um, which wasn't planned, but it was luck. Um, and I, I believe you create your own luck sometimes. And that gave you a, sort of a, a real purchase on, on, on a different kind of life? Yeah, it, it brought me back down to earth again, yes. Yeah. Well, did you ever contemplate a suicide? Twice I've done it. Um, um, I, I talk about it flippantly, and it isn't a flippant thing to talk about. The first time was um, when I lived with my girlfriend and, uh, and Bernie in a, in, a, in a flat in London. And I, I staged a suicide where I put my head in the gas oven on a pillow, but I, I left the windows open. <laughs> <laughs> Turned the gas on and left the windows open. That's yes. called hedging your bets. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And the other time, it was in 1975, when I'd flown all my family and all our relations and all the office staff in London. I mean, we, we was, the things we used to do in those days, I mean, that money's much tighter, but we hired a 707 and just flew everybody over, you know, which is crazy now. Um, but we, I was playing Dodger Stadium for two days, but I was having um, my personal life, I was involved with somebody that I didn't want to know, but I thought because of my own huge ego that I could possibly get them in the end. And it all culminated in the fact that my parents, my grandmother was there, she'd, first time she'd been to America, I think, out, let alone out the side of the country. And I had, a, I had a very nice house in Los Angeles with a swimming pool. And one day I just took 85 Valiant, 10 strength Valiant, and swanned upstairs in my huge dressing gown, my terry robe dressing gown, and said, I've taken 85 Valiums, I should be dead within the hour, threw myself in the pool, and of course the dressing gown dragged me down, and then I'm sort of fighting for life, I'm trying to save myself. <laughs> and uh, the great thing around me is people, I, and I fly into a rage sometimes, uh, and people, I, the sort of person that can go into a temper and slam the door, and then sit there for 10 minutes and everybody leaves me alone, which is the completely best way to deal with me. And as I came out the pool, my grandmother, who was 80, and said, Oh, well, she's puffing away on her cigarettes, which she does constantly. She says, I suppose we believe, believe we'll ought to pack and go home then. <laughs> <laughs> Not a word of sympathy. Um, uh, quite deservedly, I didn't deserve any sympathy. But I mean, it, 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 I do talk about flippantly, but I, you know, it, it, it's not a, it was, a, I hurt a lot of people by doing it. I joke about it now, but I was completely irresponsible and selfish to my family and everything like that. And I would never contemplate doing anything like that again. But I, I, I hope that I've matured and grown up a bit since then. Um, and I know I have, I know, because the club helped me do that. Mm. I was used to be a bad loser until I became involved with the club and you sit there and your bloody team's losing. And you have to be polite and you have to see both sides to every story. And that helped me so much. Um, and I can't thank Watford Football Club enough for that. And also, I mean, you, you did have that marvellous tap route in reality from your, from your parents and those people around yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I've, a lot you know, of people don't have, and it's terribly no, important. That's incredibly important. I'm, I think I'm one of the few people in the rock business to have had good people around me, not been ripped off that much. Because right. most people, it's very sad, they, the money just disappears. And the money, in, in, uh, if you work, then you should get what you work for. Um, and basically, it's lovely to be able to trust somebody to look after that. And trust is, and friendship is all important in life. Can I ask you finally, because you said at the uh, beginning of this interview that you were an introspective person, that you like to analyse your, your, yourself and your career. Can I ask you what you don't like about yourself um, as, a, as a person? What I don't like... <sighs> mm. <laughs> I get very jealous about things sometimes. Um, I've got a, and a very quick temper. Not as quick as I used to have, but I can be very, very intolerant and very, very... And I can be very cruel sometimes, and the way I, I can say things that are very cruel. Um, um, 
I mean, I'm talking, like, these are the sort of heavy side of things. I mean, I, th I don't like the fact that I can look at a donut and put on 50 pounds immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but you also you don't like your, your, your fingers, do you? No, no, I mean, I have the worst hands possible to play the piano. In fact, old chipolata fingers, I call them. <laughs> um, no, um, but as far as... I'm improving as a person. Uh, it sounds terribly American, isn't it? I'm really improving as a person, Michael, you know? <laughs> Ever since I started eating health foods, I really... <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to finish off this show in a moment um, with those chipolata fingers, yeah. as we call them, flying over the keyboard as he used to do down the old bull and bush yeah. on a proper, not a Steinway, a proper pub piano. Proper pub piano. We'll have a, pub, pub, have a sing song. Yeah. That'll be right after this break. <laughs> Come on, now you sing this one. Yes? 